Hi, we're here at the 2013 Florida Governor's Hurricane Conference located at the Broward Convention Center in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And behind us, we have about 60 vendors from around the nation uh, informing people about hurricane supplies like water, portable toilets, radios, batteries, all the necessities you need both pre and post storm. And additionally, upstairs, we have about 30 training tracks available for public officials who are here. That includes police officers, firemen, elected officials, and public works directors from around the country. I know specifically there's a lot of people here from New Jersey, uh, probably primarily due to Hurricane Sandy and the damage it inflicted up in the Northeast. So stay tuned. We're going to do a little tour of the area, and we look forward to you watching Sheriff's TV. Talking about emergency response to disasters, whether it be uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, ice storms, earthquakes, who knows what. Could be a man-made event, could be terrorism, who knows what. Um, we hold a lot of pre-event contracts all throughout the United States. Um, mainly here in Florida we focus. Uh, to get into a little bit about that, uh, pre-event contract is when you go into bid these projects prior to a storm hitting so that the citizens and the public officials don't have to worry about their plan because we've put that together of how we're going to clean you up after a category three hurricane hit say four. Uh, a lot of times we'll pre, uh, not a lot of times, 90 percent of the time we will do a um, pre We'll be there before the storm hits. We'll have equipment in firehouses, in first responders, uh, so that if they can't get out to the people that need attention, we can go ahead of them with heavy equipment and uh, clear the roadway so they can get through. Um, and there's a lot of planning that goes into this between the public works directors and us of all the counties and cities that we service. What we're doing is we're placing the water on the pad. This pad is magnesium and with the salt water we just put onto it, it allows the activation of the elements in the pad to activate into heat up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we put our meal, which is already a pre-made meal, we put that on top of the on top of the pad and I'll explain to you the filament on here. The filament on this is a polyester, polypropylene on the outside and cut glass on the inside. This allows for no heat to get in and no heat to get out. I should say evaporation. Now we put this in into the box I made a mistake there I should he gets in but evaporation evaporation none whatsoever and that's one of the things that when you're cooking food in a factory there's always bacteria no matter how fast you take the air out the key to this is when we put it into the retorter it sterilizes and cooks the meal to give it the extra shelf life that we work on. All of our meals have a shelf of five years. No refrigeration, no preservatives, no fillers, and it's a very, very, very tasty meal. We've been around a long time. We have been introducing our product to FEMA FEMA is one of our big customers through the DLA, which buys for FEMA. And uh, we supply the state of Florida. We have their kits right behind here. We supply over close to 400,000 of these kits, which are handed out for emergency preparedness. I am here to uh, recruit students for our new master's degree in disaster and emergency preparedness. This is a 36 credit hour master's degree program in emergency management. We have five concentration tracks, public health, cybersecurity, criminal justice, fire administration, and maritime safety and security. Our program is $535 per credit hour. We do offer a tuition discount for those who qualify. We do have financial aid. This is a degree program that a person can take 
and either enhance their current credentials and their current position, uh, take it for advancement in their current position, or get a degree in the field of emergency management. We actually started looking for a vehicle several years ago that would serve as a 911 backup center. The vehicle has nine positions that can take 911 calls or do radio dispatch over a, a typical typical radio console. As you'll see there, we have uh, radios that are on the state of Florida, slur system, we have local Harris radios, we have some radios that can run on the Motorola 800 trunk system, as well as UHF, VHF, and, and low band VHF. All the radios are actually located in a cabinet, and this was one of the nice features because on some of the command vehicles or communications vehicles we, uh, we noted, uh, each position would have a specific radio, um, say a UHF radio. Well, if in the incident you didn't need a UHF radio, that position was, was basically unusable. So this allows uh, any position within in the truck to use uh, any of the radio resources here. It is equipped with uh, voice over cellular technology. Uh, it is, uses uh, voice over IP. Uh, using a satellite connectivity so that there's voice depending on the situation if you lose cell carriers if you don't have uh, landlines that you can connect into then you have that we have that ability to provide dial tone and, and receive calls and 911 calls uh, even if the the local phone system is down after a hurricane depending on uh, the degree of of damage to an area uh, this can go in if there is infrastructure um, say say an example of 2004 um, in Charlotte County, their, their uh, 911 center, their PSAP was totally destroyed, uh, lost the roof, and they had to uh, temporarily locate to another building and then eventually moved into a mobile center. Something like this could roll in um, with the assistance, if, if there's still telco lines there on the outside of the truck, they can punch down the telephone lines and start taking 911 calls immediately. Um, if it needs dispatch, you can roll up to a dispatch center, deploys within about 20 minutes, um, it's up and running and can provide dispatch services. Uh, it does have the ability if we go to a location where their radio system is not programmed into our radios with one of their portable units, we can connect it outside the truck and, and immediately just start dispatching off that. We're still seeing too many people not heed evacuation orders. So the one thing I got to keep driving home is, is I don't care how good the forecast is, I don't care how good the products are, it doesn't seem to matter if you got it on Facebook, if you're tweeting it, if people don't act and evacuate when orders are given, we're going to continue to see loss of life due to storm surge. Water, again, was the big story, as Rick was talking about in a conference. That's where the deaths occurred. People who didn't evacuate that were in evacuation zones for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and, and addressing that, you know, our role at FEMA is to support the governors and their team as they're supporting local officials. But when people do not heed evacuation orders, it's, it's, you would think with all of the information, the death toll would continue to go down from storm surge, not creep back up. Uh, we thought, you know, I think people looked at Katrina and said this was an anomaly. But when you look at people that lost their lives in Sandy, the primary cause loss of life from the storm, storm surge, they drowned. And they drowned in areas that were forecasted to have life-threatening storm surge. Um, there's a lot of debate about how that was communicated, but again, it was communicated. There were evacuation orders, and the outcome wasn't changed. So we continue to implore people that of all the other things we do to get ready for hurricanes, the one thing that every family needs to be prepared to do, if you live in an evacuation zone, if the order is given, evacuate. Don't wait for the next forecast. Don't hope it's going to get better. Don't go by past experience and say, I've lived here all my life. Because some of you have been out there interviewing the very folks that when you asked them what happened, they said, if I had only known it was that bad, I would have left. We want them to leave before it's that bad and give the team a chance to respond, recover, and rebuild those communities without having to start off with rescues or recovering bodies.